Well, welcome everybody. I'm James Robson, an Associate Professor uh, and Director of the Scope Research Centre at Oxford University and part of CGHE Project 3. I'm delighted to chair our first panel session, Tertiary Education and Research Amid Global Crisis. In this session, we have two presenters who will discuss tertiary education research in relation to the current key challenges of COVID-19 and geopolitical tensions between the US and China. Now, before I introduce our speakers, there are a few housekeeping messages to highlight. Firstly, the conference is being recorded. Please keep your mic off during the session unless you are asking a question. During question time, indicate you want to ask a question by sending a message in the chat. Uh, please wait to be called in by me, then turn on your microphone and camera and ask your question. And my suggestion is to get your questions in as early as possible. Now, Richard Watermeyer is our first speaker. He is a professor of higher education and co-director of the Centre for Higher Education Transformations at the University of Bristol. His research is predominantly concerned with critical analyses of change and disruption in higher education, affecting the organization and governance of universities and science, academic identity and research practice, and the public role and contribution of universities and scientists. Xin Xu is our second speaker. She is a research fellow at CGHE at the Department of Education in Oxford. She works on CGHE Project 3, Research on Research, the Research Function and Mission of higher education, among other projects. Shin's research concentrates on higher education studies and research on research, specifically internationalization and globalization, research policy, evaluation and culture, as well as international academic mobility. So Richard, we'll start with you and the screen is yours. Thanks, James. I'm just playing around my computer here. Can you see me all? Can everyone see this? Uh, we can see you, but not the shared screen. Oh, wait a minute. It's coming up as shared. Bear, bear with me a second. How about now? Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. All right, we're in business. All right. Thanks, James. Thanks for the introduction. Lovely to be with everyone uh, virtually this morning. Uh, pleasure to be amongst you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, work that I've been doing with a, a few colleagues, um, which really took its uh, lift off at the beginning of the pandemic when we were uh, starting to experience as an international higher education community significant disruption caused by the pandemic, uh, most notably in terms of the emergency rapid transition to online platforms as the new modus operandi for, for working. Um, uh, obviously, we experienced our closure of campuses. We saw cessation of research. We saw people running around like headless chickens saying, how on earth are we going to manage everything that we do? Uh, so it was a, a really peculiarly interesting, unprecedented time of disruption, change and chaos and crisis uh, for, for the sector internationally, which we sought, my team and I sought to, to study empirically. Um, and to really also understand the extent to which the discourse of crisis of higher education, which has, has been around for quite a while, uh, was being further antagonized, accelerated, um, embedded, um, so the extent to which a kind of crisis discourse of, of HE, which is omnipresent in op-eds and countless books and papers that talk about uh, the ruination of the university, to, to, to borrow a phrase from Reddings and the like, uh, the extent to which that is, is ultimately been furthered by the experience of the pandemic. And, and now, I guess, where, where are we going if we can indeed contemplate the current milieu as a kind of post-pandemic environment where where are we left and where are we going uh and i think that especially in terms of thinking through the kind of post-pandemic reorganization of work uh within universities as experienced perhaps a little less so by academics certainly a lot so by professional services staff uh, within universities in terms of how uh working practices have changed 
uh, substantively and how we've embraced more in the way of kind of high flex uh, forms of, of work. Anyway, I want to discuss all this in the context of what uh, one particular survey, uh, which was trying to ascertain uh, the experiences and the perceptions of people who have left higher education since the onset of the pandemic. So we, 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 uh, and this research involves a number of colleagues from the University of the West of England uh, and Bristol and Swansea University. And what I'm going to mainly talk to today is data from a survey of about uh, 800 people that we ran. Uh, 800 UK-based uh, higher, higher education professionals, both academics and PSS uh, professional service staff working in UK universities. And uh, and the, the data specifically, uh, and we looked at data both of people who are thinking, really seriously thinking about leaving and, and individuals who have actually left since the pandemic. The data I'm going to talk to today is about those who have left uh, pandemic I think pretty much there might be one or two quotes that includes people that think seriously thinking but it, it's basically the, the this study was about trying to understand you know to what extent have we reached a tipping point uh, for uh, people in terms of their the disconsolations of higher, higher education work uh, it, it's set against a backdrop of uh, data that drawn uh, three previous empirical studies which began pretty much at the outset of the pandemic, certainly in the UK, where we entered lock, the lockdown period in March 2020, uh, and has provided a, a kind of wide consultation of in, in excess of 7,000 uh, higher education staff in the UK, and then also a wider international higher education community, and has re resulted in a plethora of, of different research outputs and engagements, both uh, with the academic communities, with policy-based communities and the like. Um, as a little bit of background to that, the, the, the kind of substantive basis of the data set was understanding the experience of the pandemic and, and how academics uh, mainly were experiencing an institutional response to the pandemic. So it was, it was less about how they experienced the pandemic, it was more about how they were experiencing the way with which their universities were responding to the pandemic. And a, a, a core focus uh, of this uh, was uh, understanding the impacts on the health and well-being of academics um, during COVID. And that took the form of four country edition surveys where we began to understand uh, these experiences and these perspectives from across the UK, uh, a smaller HE sector in, in the form of Ireland, in Australia, and also in a global the glo taking the global South perspective and, and understanding how this was being uh, imagined, uh, how this was being felt in the context of South Africa, where of course the the challenges of of removing to of moving uh, and transitioning across to digital forms and platform forms of work were especially challenging, given things such as power shedding, where electric the power South Africa for those of you that don't know it is a, as a failing power grid and the extent to which um, Power get shot, shot, shot twice a day, the extent of, of existing digital infrastructure uh, and availability of digital tools for every, anyone, students, uh, higher education, lecturers and the like, uh, to interface with a remote form of working uh, where those products were limited. Um, so just focusing specifically in terms of health and well-being and the stuff that we picked up across a pretty significant data set here was, and these these are probably all going to resonate with many of you, that COVID-19 presented a, an unprecedented period of work intensification where we saw a lot of these kinds of, sh of shifts, where we saw through the harnessing of digital technologies and working remotely, um, the, um, the unbook ending, if you like, of typical kind of working day practices uh, with people working pretty much around the clock all day all hours of all days we also saw a lot because of a lot of the kind of economic consequences and political economic consequences of of, of what the pandemic presented a, a major concerns around job precarity and certainly job scarcity and we saw that um, certainly in our own experience of the uk right at the beginning of the pandemic where concerns amongst many university leaders apropos the extent to which border closures closed campuses would affect student uh, retention and recruitment of students and the impact of that on terms of university finances funneling through in terms of um, the sustainability of academic careers and, uh, and opportunities for jobs. Um, we also saw, and this has been a major, major issue, which dovetails in with, with a, a few other projects that I'm currently running, which look at uh, the changing nature of leadership in higher education. 
and a, a big international uh, scoping study I ran with um, Rich Bolden at UE and Bruce McFarlane, who's now in Hong Kong for Advance HE, and an international scoping study looking at the changing nature of leadership in the context of its context, in, in terms of values and in terms of future competencies. Uh, uh, and one of the things we found in, in this project that ties into some of the advanced HE work was this sense of the erosion of trust in university leaderships amongst academic, both academic faculty and professional service staff, but with amongst academic faculty most especially, and the further exacerbation of this kind of us and them, um, cultural dissonance within campuses and the like. And a lot of this erosion of trust based upon the fact that you saw the majority of universities moving towards and still being operated on the terms of crisis management. Uh, and crisis management uh, being understood in the terms of non-consultative forms, uh, undemocratic forms of governance, where uh, the voice of academics and other staff within universities were seen to be marginalised, and that creating further destabilisation within university communities. So we've got work intensification, we've got job precarity scarcity, we've got erosion of trust. And then the other thing we've got, which was a, a major thing that, that came up, was this sense of kind of deterioration of mental health. So we see exacerbation of pre-existing concerns around mental health crisis affecting, yes, students, but also significantly staff, and the extent to which uh, many individuals were experiencing a variety of forms of mental illness, uh, mental health problems. Uh, anxiety, depression, loneliness, et cetera, et cetera. However, uh, quite interestingly, a lot of that data is, 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 is also fluxed, has been prone to, to change as well with many people now in the context of the kind of post-pandemic setting, also uh, embracing and identifying with many of the affordances that are brought about by the reorganization of work and transition towards more remote forms of working. Okay. Uh, and uh, conscious of time, I need to fly through these. We've also we've also got the concerns around the exacerbation of historical um, inequalities within university contexts, especially as it relates to things like uh, gender and unevenness in terms of work burden as experienced across different social variables. Okay. So uh, in terms of the, the specific survey that looked to understand, well, why are people leaving since the pandemic? And obviously there's good reason. We've seen some of that um, uh, in terms of some of the pre, some of the pandemic based surveys. We, we a, theoretically, we, we utilized uh, Durkheim's notion of anime to think about the extent to which uh, these are a community that are being further pushed, further marginalized from and, and are suffering a significant sense of kind of cultural based, values based disconnection within their institutional communities. But this, again, is also set against a, a lot of uh, quite recent survey data, some of which has been collected by UCU, University College Union in the UK which reported things like this, we've, got, we've now got a workforce in crisis, uh, projections that two thirds of, of their survey respondents of their membership, this was a survey that UCU's membership, were talking about leaving the sector. Um, so we got, we've got a, a sense here and, and a, a further thing there in terms of 81% of staff between 18 to 29. So those more earlier in their careers talking about leaving HE uh, on, a, on the basis of a lack of progress on pay and working conditions. And for those of you working in the UK and those observing in, you will be probably very well aware of the fact that the UK has experienced over the last at least four, five years, historic periods of industrial action uh, by academic and professional st service staff communities in, in respect of what has seen to be deteriorating uh, working uh, conditions and as relates to things like remuneration and pension schemes. And even the Times Higher Education chipped in uh, with their 2022 Global Work-Life Balance Survey, which was talking about the extent of work intensification. So our uh, theorizing here is, this, this, the, is to say that, you know, we, we potentially now in a kind of post-pandemic um, continuing crisis mode uh, uh, milieu, we, we're kind of crossing an anomic threshold. OK, but but it's it's fair to say, and this was something we certainly picked up within the our survey work, that there, there are, of course, different degrees uh, and levers of precarity uh, as experience as a motivation for leaving the academy. We've got racialized, we've got gendered, we've got social based inequities. We've got and this is referring back to some of the, the issues around gender. Uh, we've got care led affected precarity, which was obviously especially prominent during the pandemic, where a lot of research points to a significant bias in terms of the amount of um, pastoral care provided by female academics uh, as compared to male academics. Um, 
And then we've got this this kind of standard kind of neoliberal trend in terms of the self responsibilization of health and well being, uh, and that the furthering of this um, has further normalized, made acceptable systemic neglect uh, and the absence of an ethics of care within universities, which are also in, uh, responsible for concealing uh, or is attributed to for, for the concealing of the prevalence of work based exploitation. Um, so, you know, COVID is central to all of this kind of stuff, but, you know, this stuff wasn't happening uh, just when COVID, you know, there's a long kind of legacy and his historical record of this. And in the in the current context, we can also think about um, COVID accelerating or post-COVID accelerating, but also other factors accelerating um, staff attrition within universities and, and the wider kind of disconsolations of, of, of academic workforce that relate, for instance, to financial instability across the higher education sector globally. Uh, policy hostility, I think it's pretty obvious that in the UK context, especially that we're seeing um, holistic, uh, higher education, uh, hostile po higher education policy. And of course, a lot with regards to techn technological disruption, and we can only see in the space of the last few months, the, the total media storm and uh, huge public interest and hysteria that's been generated by uh, generative AI and the implications for the use of generative AI in the context of both teaching, research, and, and for education more broadly. Okay, so I'm going to just delve into some of the uh, uh, quant uh, qualitative data that we collected through the survey. So the survey included Likert scale kind of attitudinal based scale questions, but it also provided an opportunity for respondents to provide open text um, responses, which is the main part of the two papers that we've one which we've written up as under review and the other one which is currently uh, being developed, which talks to these uh, personalized stories of, of experiences of how um, they have been motivated to, to leave the academy. So the, so the first thing to say is that, yeah, you know what, it, it is this kind of a, a nomic threshold, this anomic pinch point, this wake up bomb that COVID-19 provided that people were actually as has been said of a lot of, uh, of the literature, which talks about the kind of great resignation and quiet quitting as a consequence of the pandemic, the extent to which it's kind of woken up a sense of, um, or, or further mobilized a sense of disconsolation and disconsolation moving to people saying, I've had enough. Um, so COVID-19 provided something of a, of a wake up bomb um, to people saying, we're no longer willing to tolerate uh, many of the inequities, the injustices, and the sense of brokenness of, of the higher education uh, community. Uh, this sense of, and this theme of brokenness uh, was common to many of these accounts of individuals who've left, uh, who also talk further about this kind of erosion of, of trust in terms of leadership, in terms of the problems of the metricization of higher education, um, uh, and, and playing and uh, placing a, a, a significant emphasis in terms of the um, apathy and antagonism faced by government um, with regard uh, in in respect to the higher education system. Okay. We also get, sadly, a lot of reports found within the data in terms of people rationalizing why they've left around bullying, harassment, discrimination. And people are having a really tough time in terms of dealing with this in terms of, in, in the sense that they you know they've been part of a, a kind of vocation a, a sense of identity that is linked um, to, to their job and what they do but they've left um, because they could no longer tolerate the extent to which these things have have grown and grown and grown as, as problematics okay uh all pretty familiar uh, stuff here, but further uh, concerns here and attribution uh, made towards issues of pay, progression, pensions, job security, more in terms of the kind of in unequal treatment, prejudicial and discriminatory behaviours within universities, all of it pushing people to say we've had enough. And then some kind of really problematic stuff that we get to, which which uh, is especially important in uh, my current work, which is looking at this notion of evolving leadership within universities. And it's the extent of this kind of toxic management, but also what we call Teflon management, management that, that has a stickiness to it that doesn't move on. And the extent to which uh, there is an experience of kind of nepotism, uh, uh, harboring of these kinds of um, um, deleterious and injurious behaviors within universities. 
And a large part of that, and I think this was also picked up in some of our uh, advanced HE work, was the extent to which certain quite per pernicious characteristics, um, narcissism, uh, you know, arrogance, uh, this kind of toxicity that's not that's attributed within management cultures, are types and characteristics, forms of behaviors that are, that are, that are not uh, protected against or sanctioned, but in many respects are actually valorized and incentivized. But ultimately, there was also a sense that was writ large within the survey data of complicity. You know, we are part and parcel of the state of, of being. Um, and um, while we've got dreadful senior leaders and we've got excessive working hours and we've got unethical practices, uh, uh, we still have academic collusion. Um, and this is further perpetuating and, and failing to stall the, the, this, this sense of what we've previously called uh, of pandemia. Uh, the extent to which higher education is a consequence and as, as accelerated by the, pande by the pandemic has further fallen into a state of ruination and disarray. But then we've got also a bit of a problem here in so much as many individuals are, for those that, that feel that they can leave, they have an exit strategy. They have a, a means of removing themselves from much of the kind of misery and injustice which we've documented here. But for others, they can't. And they were, they were, they were actually even within the survey data amongst those who were saying that they were really seriously thinking about leaving, who said, you know what, as much as we really want to, we can't because we've become too institutionalized. Our, uh, the ability for us to shift out of academia into other forms of employment is just not tenable. Um, some people saying, you know, that they're trapped. They can't do this on the basis of the kind of um, income that they already receive and, and a sense of having to start again if they were to move outside of uh, an academic role. And another major part, which is probably not particularly surprising, is the extent to which this would uh, necessitate a kind of form of identity reconstruction. And for those who've spent, you know, years and years and years uh, in terms of through their, their education, getting to a point of actually being able to get a foothold on the academic job uh, ladder and then moving through the grades, you know, there was a form of identity investment in this and to move away from that would 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 form almost a kind of divorce from selfhood um, and that was seen to be especially problematic we were quite keen within the data amongst those who've left to also identify and understand where they're going uh, so if they are leaving he and despite you know the, the sense that many people might not have a viable exit strategy and have all sorts of um, self-concept kind of problems to contend with uh, we did pick up a few things here um, and that was that for many people, they, they'd either gone self-employed. So we had almost 50% there of, of our respondents say that they'd gone self-employed or they'd moved into an alternative sector. They'd been able to find other viable uh, employment that was in some shape or form linked to their uh, skill set. Some talked about being employed in a non-UK university. And we also identified within many of these um, open text responses, the impact of Brexit. Um, and again, you know, you've got this kind of perfect storm of Brexit, the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera, cost of living crisis, and, and these variety of forces playing a part in terms of causing people to say, we've had enough, uh, we're out of UK HE. Some were taking early retirement, some were even uh, unemployed, and, and, and we also, of course, had another uh, category there of, of individuals, don't have time to go into that now. But we do get a bit of a sense in terms of where people are going if they are leaving higher education. Um, so in brief summation, move that. Uh, these are some of the overriding kind of characteristics and uh, that were, were picked up from our survey data in terms of the reasons that were really motivating people to say, nope, we're heading out of the academy. So we get first off more in terms of the way with which, yes, we've had work intensification, we've got precarity, but we've also got increased competitiveness within the higher education labor market. Um, We've got staff precarization and casualization, which has further in, uh, augmented. We've got the worsening workforce inequality of specific and special mention there was with regards to gender based forms of inequality, glass ceilings, unequal burdens, uh, gender type burdens and the like. We've got a mental health crisis, which clearly and a lot of our previous surveys also report on the extent to which this has been exacerbated by the pandemic or what we're calling pandemia. And also a sense with which things like uh, post-COVID syndrome or what's commonly referred to as long COVID is, is really, really poorly understood, yet is also, um, if not quite ubiquitous, uh, common to higher education contexts, yet also poorly responded to. 
Uh, we've got this breakdown of trust and, and a furthering of the kind of us and then cultures. Uh, and this turn towards crisis management is further inflaming this uh, and eroding trust within universities and within uni with university leadership. We've got the challenges here in terms of a blended or high flex learning, uh, hybridized pedagogy, how are we actually going about doing our teaching um, and the like. What are the new challenges in terms of the reorganization of work uh, for university communities? We've got the hostility of the policy environment that I've already spoken about, uh, pertinent especially to UK, but other uh, higher education sectors that uh, uh, are, um, sit within populist governments. We've got this concern also in terms of the extent to which technological development and certainly the, the advance of things like generative AI could actually contribute to further stratification. Uh, and this is part of the project, the overall digitalization of higher education could uh, prompt further stratification of, within the university sector and uh, an overall sector contraction. Are there institutions there that just won't be able to cope? Uh, and what therefore does that mean for the future of academic careers? And we've got fundamentally the sense that we, you know, OK, it might not be quite a great resignation as reported in, in many other sectors, but there is significant workforce attrition going on. And there is diaspora of UK academics, especially to other international higher education settings. So what does this say about the future of academic work and crucially about its fading allure? Uh, and we might think of this also as set against uh, the fact that we are governed according to prestige economics and a sense of value that we chase within higher education dominated by what I call competitive accountability. Uh, and then the promise, the threat of gender, that should be generative AI, apologies, the promise and threat of generative AI and what that means for higher education. To what extent is this really now a game changer and to what extent are we potentially going to see increased automation? Are we going to see job obsolescence? You know, to what extent are many of the concerns currently uh, a, 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 with regards to the, the impact of digitalization, how much are they going to follow through and what does this mean for the academic career? So where do we go from here, everyone? Hmm, tricky one. So this is some of the stuff that we're currently grappling with and beginning to, to kind of theorize. Um, in very practical terms, is there a sense that we actually could do with moving away from a lot of the blame game that has perpetuated and has been ubiquitous certainly for the last five years? Um, and has been directed towards, and this is very pro provocative, but is, is moving away from the brain game of university leaders and is instead committed to a collective endeavor of university leadership. To what extent can we begin as a, as a full community to embrace a sense of personal responsibility for the leadership of our communities? Um, resistance may and retreat if we are seeing people moving out. Uh, 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 this may only further exacerbate the sense of kind of the enemy and the dissonance, the cleft between us and them. How do we get past that? To what extent can we also, we, we talk a hell of a lot about leadership, but what about followership? Uh, to what extent can we begin to engage with a, a, the practice of active and courageous followership? And how do we uh, embrace a need to redress a, a trend? Because this is, this is very clear. We have really bad human management within our university sector and, and this was writ large both within the survey but within other studies that we've been undertaking um, how do we begin to to deal with that um, these are clear steps that we need to to do uh, engage with and move forward and how do we how do we deal with and do more around that kind of uh, reparation and restitutional work uh, for our identities and our, our work-based cultures so the one suggestion that we're currently playing with in terms of looking at this work and especially the, the challenge of leadership H and its impact, the toxic management cultures that we've described is taking more of a kind of dialectical approach to understanding leadership. And this is, this is probably really important because if we look across the sector, we see uh, you know, many of these tensions and many of these kind of contradictions in part, we have autonomy and control. We have competition, but we've also got collaboration. We've got the economic obligations and the economic realities within which the higher education sector is governed by, yet also so much of this kind of social value aspirations. And just touching on that kind of notion of autonomy and control, what, what we found really interesting with the data of the, the survey was the extent to which, yes, many people were complaining hell and tooth about the extent to which many of their work-based privileges had been eroded, that their, you know, the sense of academic autonomy, academic freedoms had been, had been seen to be corrupted and, and eroded. Yet at the same time, many people when challenged, and one of the questions we asked was, what's good about working in higher education, which I haven't actually presented here, I provided instead the rather negative uh, account. 
uh, was the extent to which an individuals understood their uh, power education staff, both pro services staff and academics, understood the extent to which they were able to practice uh, professional based freedoms, to have criticality, to have flexibility. Um, so we get the real tensions here in terms of competing discourses of what's wrong and what's right about uh, career careers in HE. And apologies if I've gone over James, but I shall stop and end there. Well, thanks very much, Richard. That was uh, a really fascinating and excellent presentation. Um, I think we'll move straight on to uh, to Shin's presentation. And colleagues, keep putting your uh, your questions in the chat. We'll hopefully have a few minutes at the end to uh, to address some of those. So Shin, over to you. Thank you very much, James and Richard. So I'll try to share my screen. I hope it's working. <clears throat> yes, uh, yes, thank you, James. So um, um, thank you everyone for joining and following up with the discussions about the uh, pandemic, I'm going to talk about international research collaborations among our geopolitical tensions, which is another form of crisis that international research and tertiary education are facing. So to start with, why are we talking about international research collaboration, which may seem like a really simple and straightforward question to many people? Uh, so we all understand that international research collaborations are important. They are important to tackling global crises that we're facing because tackling those uh, grand issues and challenges require different countries and different researchers holding hands and require collective efforts from all over the world. However, we're talking about international international research collaboration not just because it's important, but also because it's in danger. So there are different forms of storms that are that international research collaborations have been facing and the geopolitical tensions has been one of them. And then in this session, why talking about US-China research collaboration and why is it important to understand global research systems and the global research environment? Um, this is not just because this is one of my research expertise areas, uh, because I would like to learn more from other colleagues about other like uh, forms of research collaborations in the world, for instance, the so called South to South research collaborations and research collaborations amid the Russia Ukraine war, etc. Those are also important issues. Um, but here today I'm talking about US China research collaboration, partly because that's where my research focuses, and also partly because the two science systems play important roles in global science systems. So to start with, um, we'll be looking at some of the data and we'll be having a very quick guessing game. But before that, I should um, clarify certain limitations and caveats of some of the data that I'm, I'll be showing and using. So first of all, all, almost all of the data that are presented by the existing bibliometric analysis of the publication patterns are based on Web of Science, and Scopus, or selected journals in Nature Index, etc. And those uh, databases are mostly from the so-called Global North or Western Europe and Anglophone countries and are not inclusive of all the publications or all the knowledge created around the world in different languages and by different cultures. Um, so David had an excellent keynote about those. If you're interested, uh, please visit the uh, revisit the recording of the keynote. Um, and then the second caveat is that there's a lack between publications and research collaborations. So we'll be seeing the evidence of our research collaboration activities that may be one year or a few months at least before the publication uh, came out. And then the third one is that co-authored publications is only one of the indicators of the forms of international research collaboration because there are other forms of collaboration that are happening but cannot be codified as like international publications. Um, but Despite all these limitations, those figures do provide us with some understandings and snapshots of the codified research in the current research or global research system. So first of all, 
in terms of the volume of published research, here I'm showing the top three uh, countries that has like the highest share of worldwide peer reviewed science and engineering publications. As you can see, the third position is taken by India and it has around 5% of publications. And can you guess how, what is the percentage of China and the US? I'll give you two seconds. Um, so here is the figure. So China and US together publish around or beyond one third of the uh, global science and engineering publications and they, they far pass uh, other countries in terms of the share of the total volume of published science and engineering uh, knowledges in the world. And then in terms of the citation numbers, although citations cannot be necessarily like an indicator as research quality, but they do showcase to a certain extent the influence of the research and, and, and the uses of the research. So the US ranks the second in terms of the number of top 1% and top 10% papers um, measured by citation counts and China ranks the first in the world. And also in terms of research collaboration, uh, the two countries are the top collaborators with each other with really high proportion of co-authored publications as measured by Nature, uh, Nature Index publications. And then the two countries not only collaborate closely with each other, they also closely collaborate with other countries in the world, including both like the traditionally Western countries or Anglophone countries, um, and also countries in East Asia, in um, uh, other regions in the world. Um, and then for, for the United States, uh, it has like wider research collaboration networks in regions like Latin America and Africa than China does. But this is the current landscape. I'll come back to this uh, very soon later. And then when we're talking about US-China research collaboration, what happened? Uh, most, of, most of the people in this room might have like been familiar with the stories or with what happened. But here I had like snapshots of some of the um, news headlines from the US, um, from the uh, world news of um, higher education and you can see, maybe you can guess like from which year those news happened. And not surprisingly, we're seeing this kind of the downturn or the uh, cooling effects of the research collaborations, uh, international academic mobility, including academic and students mobility between China and the US, and also the um, rising concerns over the collaborations between the two countries. And those are what we're seeing in the, during the uh, so-called new Cold War period that happened before the pandemic happened, particularly under the Trump and Xi um, governance of the, of the United States and China. And in terms of research collaborations, as indicated by co-authored publications between the two countries, we're also starting to see the evidence of the decline of um, co-authored publications between the two countries. So here I'm showing the figures of um, co-authored publications between the two countries, particularly on COVID research. And we're seeing the ratio of like US-China collaboration and EU-China EU collaboration, both on the downturn, um, <clears throat> And in terms of the US-China co-authored publications uh, for COVID research, we did see a rise at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, but then a sharp decline afterwards. Um, we're also seeing larger, uh, we're also seeing more evidence based on a larger data sets in other disciplines or all more disciplines um, that shows that the research collaboration ties between China and the US, and also uh, their allies countries have been declining. And what have caused this? So we've talked about the new Cold War, which is part of what would have driven to the decoupling of the two science powerhouses in the world. But that is not the only reason for this. So historically, there have been 
ongoing or long-term geopolitical tensions between China and US, um, which can be dated back, I mean, to the Cold War or even before that, much longer than that. The um, concerns over westernization or cautious against the West um, in China started long before that and can be dated back into ancient Chinese times and also are very much imprinted by the colonial past and history that happened in the um, uh, in, in the last centuries. And then from the United States, there, there have also been misinterpretations or wrong expectations about China. For instance, um, the wrong expectations of China, you know, being able to westernize fully and 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 had then hadn't come to in the case of uh, when in the case of Chinese modernization. Uh, China has been modernized, has developed, uh, has like the economy has expanded, um, but then it hasn't developed into like a Western country in terms of its cultures, traditions, political systems, economic uh, systems, educational systems, etc. And then the um, COVID-19 pandemic also exacerbated the challenges that um, the China-US research collaborations face, um, especially during the lockdowns, because international research collaboration heavily relied on the mobility of academics and students, and that involved both physical mobility and also virtual mobility. I mean, during the COVID-19 period and the lockdown periods, although uh, the online activities and virtual, virtual engagements online have been increasing, there are limitations about them. And, and particularly in the case of China, with the limited access to internet and censorship and etc., um, making international Zoom calls can be difficult or challenging for some of the researchers, uh, for instance. So it has been difficult for China to connect with the world during the lockdowns. Um, and then there are also other issues around the world, such as the rise of nationalism or a more nationally oriented agendas and practices and policies and discourses and that are reflected in for instance the brexit um here in the uk or the uh, vaccine nationalism that we have been witnessing uh during the covid 19 pandemic where when different countries have been racing and competing and protecting the uh, vaccine not seeing them or treating them as global public good but as sort of an um indicators for arm race or or evidence of the um scientific protectionism so uh, those issues all contribute not contribute all cost of uh, the um rising tensions between china and us and also there's another factor that is about the uh, xenophobia and racism issues so uh that those issues have been long existed, but also again exacerbated amid the geopolitical tensions between China and US, amid the COVID-19 pandemic, when um, people from China or people related with China or people related with East Asian backgrounds in general uh, face threats, discriminations um, uh, against them because of the um, COVID-19 and relevant discussions around them. So all of those issues are causing the, um, are making it much more difficult for people, for researchers working in China and US and relevant science systems, difficult to collaborate with each other. So for instance, in the United States, um, as a uh, survey among 2000 researchers found that around 42% of Chinese researchers felt racially profiled by the US government, uh, which under the Trump administration was an, 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 the, by the China Initiative, an initiative to clamp down the perceived economic um, espionage by China. 
and that is in comparison to only 9% of Chinese researchers. And in the United States, we're also seeing the decline of our researchers claiming or acknowledging dual affiliations between China and United States. And in other countries, such as the United Kingdom and Australia, we're also witnessing the rising questions over or cautious against collaborations with China, usually associated with concerns about national security. Um, and then Chinese researchers and students also faced increasing challenges in, for instance, obtaining visas to visit those countries. Um, and then here, we can see the decline of the Australia-China Research Collaboration in the uh, Australia Research Council's Discovery Project Program, which is just one small evidence of the decline of or decoupling of research collaborations. And also in terms of international student mobility, although China remains the top student sending country to many uh, so-called Western countries, like the United States, uh, United Kingdom. Um, Chinese students are also reconsidering, have been or had been reconsidering the choices of their study abroad destinations. Um, although the United States may remain as like the most popular study abroad destinations, the total number of students going there and the number of students staying there may be changing. Um, but then in, when we're seeing the decoupling of those two science powerhouses, are we seeing the decoupling of the international research collaborations in general? That is not the case. So for instance, in terms of the um, international collaborations between China and other parts of the world, we're actually seeing the rise of it. Um, here on the left-hand side, we're seeing the growth growth rate of co-authored publications between China and different parts of the world. Um, we can see that in terms of China OECD countries collaboration and China EU collaboration, the growth rate had been like 1.2 over the um, over the compa uh, compared periods of time. But then in terms of the collaborations between China and Western Asia with the so-called um, Middle East, um, and China and Africa, China, Latin America, China and Belt and Road countries, and China and ASEAN, we're seeing a higher, much higher growth rate of research collaborations that happened between those systems. And there are also evidence uh, showing a more diversified international research collaboration landscape, because although we're seeing from the China perspective, it takes two to tango, it means that other countries are also reconsidering or making changes in terms of the um, collaborators and partners that they're choosing for, for collaboration. For instance, for selected Muslim majority science systems, their collaborations or co-authored publications with China show a steep rise uh, as compared to a more steady or slow increase of co-authored publications with the, with the United States. Um, and in terms of student mobility, we're seeing, we're also seeing that students from the Belt and Road countries accounted for around 46%, I mean, close to half of all international students studying China. And also under the Belt and Road Initiative, there have been top-down government-led initiatives and also people to people or more uh, bottom up initiatives um, between a variety number of countries. And then those collaborations happen not only between research institutions or higher tertiary education institutions, but also with the industry and the wider public and communities uh, in areas such as agriculture, new energy, etc. And that's showing a much more diversified collaboration landscape and patterns that have been happening. Um, and then after talking about all those kind of challenges and limitations and potential changes, how will the future unfold? To be honest, I don't have like a definite answer to this. And I do invite 
um, contributions and discussions and ideas and thoughts from colleagues on this topic. But here I would like to share some of the thoughts and observations. Uh, so first of all, we may be witnessing still the increased tensions between the nations, the global institutions and individuals in research systems. And we will be witnessing different pairs or different areas of tensions. For instance, the tensions may be around academic freedom and academic autonomy, uh, academic integrity and trust, and between the uh, securitization, as in some words, or the politicization of science and the national or institutional surveillance over research of what kind of research could be conducted and what kind of research topics or uh, who you can collaborate with. So those are like tensions we may be witnessing more that will happen. And those will happen as mentioned, not only in the China and in the United States. Um, we will be always also still witnessing the tensions between different ontological understandings of science. We may be still seeing like the understandings of science as you know a way of national armories or representation, demonstration of national force, and as represented as nationalism. And then that is in sharp contrast to the idea or understanding and approaches to the um, scientific globalism or like understanding science as globally networked ecosystems um, that calls for open research, that calls for open collaborations. Um, and then also we may be seeing for in, within certain national systems, the contrast and tensions and conflicts between more centralized a uh, bigger state governance of science and research and the um, need and willingness uh, for individuals agency. Because in the end, after all, research collaborations happen not only, research collaboration cannot happen without the willingness and engagement and participation uh, of individual researchers. So despite limitations and restrictions from the national or institutional perspective, there's still scope for individual freedom uh, for collaborations and continuing working with each other. And then also in terms of the global research landscape, we might be, we have been witnessing a more diversified uh, picture of this. So we're not seeing like the single hegemony or the uh, single polar hegemony of the United States or the other so-called Western or global North countries, et cetera, within global South, uh, within, with, within the global science systems. Uh, but we're, we have been witnessing the rise of China as an example that challenges the hegemonic powers in global science, but it happens not only with China, it happens with many, many other systems in the world. Uh, in, including, for instance, as we've seen India and other so-called middle powers. And those are important powers and important um, systems to note. And that sends a message to the global research community that it is really important to be respectful of all the knowledges created by it from different countries, from different traditions. Um, so that include, so that invite us to reconsider the um, existing criteria or existing understandings of the global science. I've talked about the limitations of how, for instance, the current bibliometrics or the codified research um, scientific data may be, may not show us the full picture of global science and the rise of the different research systems and different knowledges with, around the world may well have potentials to help us understand global research systems beyond verb of science, beyond scopus, beyond bibliometrics, and beyond like the codified knowledges. And then in terms of international research collaboration patterns, we've been already witnessing the diversification of that. But uh, I would also like to argue or to 
point to point or to note that the changes may not happen that fast because of the pre-existing collaboration ties that have been built uh, between China and US um, that those two countries will not stop collaborating completely with each other um, and then the uh, we might still see them as like close collaborators with each other and with other countries in the short or mid terms and also the existing colonial powers or the post-colonial powers that are still shaping how the international racist collaboration work um, so we might be witnessing like a slowly diversified international research collaboration patterns but that may not happen like overnight and finally i would like to note so this will be kind of a personal note that more research or more evidence are very much needed for to help us to understand the diverse experiences and voices of people involved and that include both those who have been working within the resistance systems but also the future generations who have been educated trained grown up and uh, or amid the most the, the more intensified geopolitical tensions and those crises um this is because it is not only enough for us to see the so-called grand narratives or big pictures of, for instance, the number of publications, um, et cetera. It's also important to note the nuances and differences across different groups in terms of, for instance, disciplines. We've been talking or looking at data mainly about scientific or so-called natural sciences publications, for instance, in this presentation. Uh, how about humanities and social sciences, which face like even more harsh challenges in terms of international collaborations because of political and ideological issues. And then we, we, we also need to understand different identities of researchers, including ethnicity, race, uh, gender, and other other characteristics of researchers and that will help us to understand the um, more of the scope of individual agencies amidst those geopolitical tensions and with this i'll conclude my presentation and thank you very much for listening um i look forward to your questions and comments thank you Thanks, Jin. Uh, really fascinating talk and, and really interesting to see that data. Um, colleagues, we just have a, a, a few minutes for questions. Um, so I'll take, a, take a, a couple, but I'll just ask you to be very brief in, uh, in asking your questions. Uh, we'll start with Kaho. Uh, Kaho, would you like to come in? Yeah, thank you, James. And uh, thanks, uh, Xun, for a wonderful presentation. A very quick uh, response. I enjoy your talk very much. But I just wonder, you know, in what way as a community of international uh, international researchers, what could we do in uh, promoting more collaboration in addressing about the issue you outline? I would like to hear from you. Thank you. Xin, do you want to, uh, to respond? Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Mock, for the question. Um, so in terms of individual researchers, I think there are much more we can do within I mean, the uh, scope of our own autonomy, because as mentioned, international research collaboration are fundamentally like people to people. I mean, there are institutional <laughs> institutional support and national in, in infrastructure, infrastructure that are needed, but uh, it starts from the willingness and trust between people, right? So as international researchers, I think maybe if there are like more willingness and trust that can be built across individuals there are things that can be done despite or within the scope of the limited resources um that that that, that international researchers are facing yes thanks Shin. i'm, I'm just going to squeeze in one last question i think because uh, time is is moving on but if, if celia is still here i think it'd be great to have have your input celia because i know you've done some work in uh, in in academics leaving academia. So she wants to come. Thanks. Well, well my um comments were to Richard really. I, I was 
really interested in his work. Uh, you're, well, I know it's um, a group of you doing the work. Thank you very much uh, for the updating. Um, well, I had two main questions. One was, was there a distinction between professional staff's ability to leave and academic staff's ability or desire to leave? And secondly, just to mention that we did ask the same question in the work we did pre-COVID uh, on our CG project 3.2. And we discovered that those who were more likely to say they were going to or wanted to leave were working part time, working extended hours, were teaching only. I mean, that's quite a critical issue in the UK and to have worked outside higher education before they started. So just a bundle of thoughts that you might like to respond to. Thanks, Celia. Um, yeah, great comments and, uh, and, and also food for thought. This is still emerging work for us. So we're still playing around with the data and seeing what we get from it. Uh, I, the, the, the first point, I suppose, is uh, the distinction between PSS and academics mm -hmm. um, in terms of exiting academia. Um, yeah, I think I think there, there clearly is a difference that we picked up in the data. And I, I think we've rationalised on the basis of enhanced job mobility for PSS staff anyway, because there's there tends to be a far greater kind of churn in and out of the academy. And also, I suppose, something around the extent of kind of... Uh, 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 a greater variety of skills that they pr provide. These are, after all, professional services people that have come from, many of whom will have come from academia, mm -hmm. have got doctoral level credentials and the like, which puts them on, often on a par with academics, but come with their own forms of professional knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is, there is definitely enhanced mobility and a greater availability of exit strategies for those. I mean, there's also, as you might anticipate, there's also a greater opportunity for exiting and, and availability of exit strategy dependent upon things like disciplinary area, uh, career stage, things like that amongst academics. The, the one point I wanted to make, though, was the fact, and we we wrote this in a, in a based on another survey that we did on professional services staff, understanding how the pandemic had impacted them and their and their work. And we talked about the kind of space, spatio relational reorganization of professional services work within universities and the extent uh, to which the pandemic actually provided something of a kind of boundary object. It allowed them to have more of mm. those kind of interactions uh, with academics, allowed to break down a lot of the work based mm. inequalities and inequities that historically have been documented as, as problematic for them. So if, if anything, actually, we see far greater prevalence of, of, of wanting to leave and of this kind of staff attrition amongst academics than professional services staff, who also in, in previous survey data that we, we uh, collected also identified that the overall competency of leadership through the pandemic was uh, they, they, they saw that they thought actually most leaders did a pretty good job compared to our surveying of academics who, who thought resoundedly, unanimously that most leaders had done a terrible job. Um, so we get we get major di distinction there mm. in terms of the, the overall kind of uh, appraisal of performance of leadership throughout the pandemic and what that then for means for them. But certainly, absolutely, in terms of the, the kind of the potential of exit strategy. The final thing to add to that is the the, the difference in terms of um, identity. And I touched upon it briefly, but the extent to which academic mm. the, the weddedness of academics to life mm. as an academic, which can only be seemingly contained within a university environment, right? To go beyond that is, is basically a denunciation, disavowal of identity, mm -hmm. which of course doesn't really matter so much for PSS staff. They're, they're, and it's, it's a notion of kind of affiliation, institutional affiliation versus kind of scholarly affiliation, I suppose, if we can put it that. And that obviously being a, a point of difference between the two different communities. Thanks, Richard. Um, thanks, Celia, for some excellent comments. I think, colleagues, we have to bring this to a close. I'd like to thank um, Shin and Richard for your excellent presentations and everybody for your excellent uh, uh, questions and comments in the chat. Uh, our next session is the public character of tertiary education, and it starts at 11.45. So see you there, and thanks again. <laughs>